Hello and welcome. I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. And in today's podcast, I am joined by a very special guest, and that is Noel May from the Financial Planning Standards Board in Denver. And Noel is the chief executive of the professional body that authorizes and sublicenses the CFP marks around the world outside the US. In this podcast, we talk about all things relating to certified financial planner and CFP, both in the UK and globally. And we have some really interesting discussions about the potential futures and indicators of what might happen in the years to come, and also the spread of financial planning across the globe. So this is a fantastic podcast if you are a certified financial planner yourself, but also if you are interested in taking your CFP license um, anywhere in the world in the coming 12 months. So welcome, everybody. Um, My name is Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. And today is my very first podcast. Um, And as I was saying in my trailer, if you've seen it this week, um, we are talking all things a certified financial planner. And I'd like you to welcome my very first guest, Noel May, the Chief Executive of the Financial Planning Standards Board. Welcome, Noel. Hi, Jackie. Delighted to be on your show and uh, honoured to be your first guest. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing to be on the show. Um, So, The aim of today is to talk all things certified financial planning, things relating to not only just the UK, but seeking your views about what's happening around the world and where CFP fits into the kind of global push for improved quality of advice to clients um, across the globe. I'd be happy to do that. Excellent. So let's fire off with a few questions that we have in already. Um, So, you know, in the UK, um, the regulator, as always over the years, has always put that emphasis on uh, regulation over the advice of selling a particular product. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you and I know that that financial planning really essentially hasn't got much to do with products at all, has it? So where do you think that, um, you know, financial planners can really kind of earn their and their money um, and where being a certified financial planner has the advantage over everybody else. Yeah, look, well, so I like, Jackie, that you kicked it off with a big question. So <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let, me, let me give you um, a, bit, a bit of an extended answer. Like, to, to some extent, this has really been the story of financial services and financial planning over um, decades, right? So, you know, traditionally, when you think um, of how financial planning and particular certified financial planner certification got its start over 50 years ago, It was people who are traditionally in that single sector product selling state who were looking to say, surely there's a better way of doing this. Um, And so in the US over 50 years ago, it was people who were traditionally in insurance selling and in mutual fund selling who came together and said, imagine if instead of chasing down people and selling them products they may not want, um, what if we sat down with the people, got to understand who they are, what their situation was, what their goals and dreams were, and then put together a plan that actually might involve products as well that would get them to where they want to go. So this genesis of financial planning and the development of financial planning as a profession has really always gone hand in hand with the product distribution side of financial services. And so it's been a, an ongoing dialogue between Financial Planning Standards Board, between the professional bodies in each of the territories with the regulators to really talk about, well, let's be clear on the distinction between product distribution Let's be clear on the distinction of maybe limited scope advising. And then let's be clear on what is holistic or integrated financial planning. And at the end of the day, all of those are fine in their own context. And in fact, they all work well together. But it's just really, I suppose, making sure that the consumer, the members of the public, the client is clear. What are they looking for? What are they getting? And what is the person they're talking to qualified to deliver? 
And, and so that's really been the focus for the global certified financial planner community, financial planning standards board over the last many years is to say there's a role for um, financial planning. There's a role for um, individuals being able to find somebody who's competent and ethical, who put the client's interest first in putting together a plan of action. And that if products are being delivered, they're actually the right products for that client based on that client's circumstance and need. So, so for us, really, that's the embodiment of Certified Financial Planner, um, the program. What we're looking to do is to be able to assure the public, if you're looking for somebody who's competent, who's ethical, who's qualified, and will put your interests first, look for Certified Financial Planner. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so... Is it the same in other countries? In the UK, there are quite a lot of people who call themselves a financial planner. Obviously, there there is a chartered financial planner here as well, um, which I think, you know, applies in in a couple of other countries too. But is it true that in in other countries, there are a lot of or growing number of financial advisors now calling themselves financial planners, perhaps without being a CFP professional? Sure. And look, this has been... um an ongoing issue in many territories for for quite some time. And it's this this overuse, misuse, abuse of titles. Um, And so it's not just people necessarily, you know, overusing or misusing the title financial planner. You have wealth manager, you have retirement wealth consultant. You have any number of terms and credentials being used. And I think what we've got to do is fundamentally come back to the consumer to, to the potential client um, of the financial services marketplace and sort of say, how do we help these people identify somebody they can work with? How can we help the public identify somebody they can trust? So there's been an active effort um, on the part of the FPSB network, on the part of FPSB in territories around the world and globally to work with governments, regulators, and authorities to say, could there be an opportunity to have some level of control or oversight over who can use what terms? Again, as a public interest um, effort, so that the idea that if somebody is going out in the marketplace saying they are a financial planner, what qualifies them to say they're a financial planner? Who's ensuring uh, that they've been assessed to be competent and ethical? And then who's assuring that they're meeting ongoing professional obligations? So, so one of the trends we're seeing in several of our more mature markets is where there is some effort to control use of terms. And, and as an example, in South Africa, as an example, in Ontario right now in Canada, this idea that if you're going to say you're a financial planner, uh, regulators are coming out saying, then you need to have a an appropriate qualification that would indicate you are qualified to call yourself a financial planner. And that needs to come from an appropriately authorized body. And so for us, this combination of connecting use of these terms to an underpinning training and education and then participation in a professional body can be a very powerful way to protect the public. And I think that's really interesting. I was just, while you were just explaining there, I was just thinking back to an interview I did a few years ago with some of the founders of the Institute of Financial Planning when it was their 25th anniversary. And one of the guys said to me that he was really worried about um, the number of people who weren't financial planners saying that they were. Uh, and he was sat next to, and during the one of the early IFP conferences, he was sat with somebody who described themselves as a financial planner who was actually um, leasing shipping containers. Um, Mm -hmm. And he Mm -hmm. was quite horrified. (laughs) And he was like, where on earth is this going if the term isn't regulated? But obviously, we've seen that there are there there have been issues in other countries with trying to regulate the terms. So I think sometimes we need to be careful what we wish for, don't we? A hundred percent. And and I do. You know, I think when you come to the table with regulators with government and you're looking to, in essence, 
control, regulate, or manage a space, you've got lots of competing interests that come into that space too. And ultimately, sometimes the solutions might be a little bit more awkward or contrived than, than what you had initially expected or intended. So, so for us, it really is a, is a question of, is there forward momentum? Are we directionally correct, even if at times the regulation may not come out quite the way it was originally intended? Um, and the good news here is, you know, ultimately, as these regulations, as the legislation has been put in place, um, regulators do come back and visit and see uh, what were the consequences of the regulation? Were there some unintended consequences? Did, was some of it an overreach? And where do we where do we go to adjust from there? So um, certainly there's a level of caution and a level of prudence on the part of the, the bodies offering certified financial planner certification in those engagements with regulators. But again, for us, the, the ultimate focus has got to be the client, the consumer, the member of the public. And if we're all working together with this idea that we should be putting together an ecosystem, we should be putting together um, training programs and delivering advice and services in a way that protects their interests, then the outcome is going to be a better outcome than what's been traditionally in place. Yeah, yeah. And of course, at the FPSB, you have a great relationship with IOSCO, the international securities regulator, don't you, to try and influence them at, at, at the kind of you know, more global level. Yeah. And, and look, you know, that's so, so you know, just maybe um, kind of recapping for your um, listenership, um, Financial Planning Standards Board, because, again, sometimes um, people in a territory may not be that familiar with us. So so who Financial Planning Standards Board is, we're we're a global nonprofit standard setting body for the financial planning profession. Our, our vision is to have financial planning recognized as a professional practice around the world. And the way we do that is by upholding, establishing, and promoting global standards in financial planning for the public benefit. And, and we deliver our program, we do that around the world through um, nonprofit professional and certification bodies in now coming up to 27 countries and territories around the world. And while each of those bodies is engaging in their markets with firms and educators and regulators, we felt it was important that um, Financial Planning Standards Board complement that territory-specific regulatory outreach with engagement with the regulatory community at the global level. So the International Organization of Securities Commissions is in effect the membership organization for securities regulators or regulators involved in securities around the world. And we thought it was important that as they were having conversations around the, the requirements of the market and the need for consumer protection issues, particularly in the area of securities, that they understand what financial planning is and they understand how financial planning and how a global community of professional certified financial planner professionals can support um, this regulatory aim at consumer protection. So, so we've been a member of IOSCO for, I'm going to say, seven plus years. And about five years ago, um, when IOSCO launched uh, World Investor Week, um, which was a week where they were going to really focus on educating the public about securities markets and about investing, um, Financial Planning Standards Board pitched to IOSCO that investing without, con uh, without context wasn't actually that useful. And it would be really helpful for people to understand if they can identify their goals, their needs, and their objectives for investing, they'll have much more successful outcomes. So, so we've partnered with IOSCO, and we deliver World Financial Planning Day every Wednesday of World Investor Week. And we've been having that partnership with IOSCO now for, we're in our fifth year this year. And we're really excited at the opportunity of bringing in front of regulators around the world and members of the public, what is financial planning? What's it about? How does it fit with what might be a more traditional uh, securities or product elements of the market? That's really interesting because I think I think our listeners would be interested to hear just how you know how the FPSB interacts with the professional bodies who are delivering 
um, you know, sub-licensing and delivering the CFP training programs in the various countries. Are there different ways that the FPSB interacts with those professional bodies and organizations? Well, well, the, the first is probably common among all of them. And so Financial Planning Standards Board owns the Certified Financial Planner Certification Program outside the United States. And we license um, use and rights of that program to those professional certification bodies that are our affiliates around the world. So the fundamental point of connection between FPSB and then between CISI in the UK or FP Canada in Canada or CFP board in the US is we're working with those organizations to ensure that the certified financial planner certification program being delivered in a territory is being delivered to a global standard and that is still being appropriately localized so that it is relevant in each of the jurisdictions in which we have a program. So a lot of the way we work with these certifying and professional bodies around the world is making sure that we're providing an appropriate global framework of financial planning standards, that we're providing appropriate certification requirements and standards for the program, and then we're facilitating those organizations taking and localizing the program. Uh, we will then follow through and on a regular basis, we will audit delivery of the program to make sure that we are maintaining that global consistency around the world in the program. And of course, separate then and apart from our principle, our core function of setting standards and certification requirements and supporting the delivery of that in each territory, we then spend a lot of time working in the network um, with the chief executives and the leadership of each of those organizations on best practice sharing around certification program delivery, best practice sharing on growing the pipeline of individuals coming to certification, and best practice sharing around promoting increased awareness and understanding of financial planning and certified financial planner certification to a variety of audiences. You know, as you know, Jackie, you know, COVID in the last year and a half has really driven us all digital at this point, maybe even driven some of us a little bit crazy. But um, to the point of view of traditionally, we would bring together the leadership of each of those professional bodies on an annual basis to meet in person and really kind of leverage those connections into, you know, a vibrant, connected global community that can leverage of each other and share ideas and really help us grow and build this profession and the Certified Financial Planner Certification Program. And I think that, that was one of the amazing things in my time being involved with the FPSB is that both, you know, and with the IFP and with the CISI is that for me, it was a real sense of community that everybody's trying to support um, everybody else or the other countries willing to share those best practice ideas, things that have worked, things that haven't worked to help uh, others avoid those sorts of mistakes. Um, it was quite quite something special, a special relationship that, that all the organisations have, isn't it? Yeah, and look, I would say that's probably one of the core um, value propositions of the Certified Financial Planner Certification Programme and the FPSB Network is it's not only that sense of community, it's really the sort of the active willingness on the part of either the professional bodies or CFP professionals around the world to share. So, so if people have a good idea, if people have figured something out, they're more than willing to share it. And I think that's what's amazing for me and a real positive sign for how the profession is developing around the world is it doesn't come from this, you know, perspective of, you know, the pie is only so large. Uh, there's a real desire on the part of the practitioner community and the professional body community to say, let's share, let's build each other up, let, let's, let's improve the profession in each of our territories for the benefit of the public. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I've been doing this for quite a while now, Jackie, mm -hmm. Um, and, and what I love, honestly, is, you know, if I get a, a query or a question somebody's asking me, I can reach out to people that I've known for 25 plus years. I can reach out to people that maybe I haven't talked to for a couple of years 
and I can say, hey, there's somebody over in South Africa that has a question. There's somebody in the UK who wants to connect to somebody in Hong Kong. And it, it's just the, the, the responses are immediate. The responses are, you know, helpful. And, and that for me is a, a real positive sign that this, when people get the Certified Financial Planner certification, they are really becoming part of a global community and, and thrive in that as well. And, and I will say, you know, and, and you've experienced it certainly, that to me was one of the wonderful elements of the program in the UK is I always enjoyed going to the conferences in the UK because the community in the UK was so connected and so engaged and, and actually wanted to get together to really learn from each other, share, share best practices and build a program together. So certainly for us going forward in the UK, that's something that I want to see stronger than ever um, and, and something that we'll be looking to support CISI on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And do you think that there are lessons that um, certified financial planners in the UK can learn from other territories, from other CFPs around the world? For sure, for sure. So, like, you know, lessons learned opportunity can be between the practitioners themselves and certainly between, you know, the professional bodies, the certification bodies. So, So, as I mentioned before, from the point of view of, uh, you know, CISI has the opportunity for best practice sharing and learning from the network. Some of the things that, you know, we've seen work successfully in other territories, we're now seeing being put in place in the UK. So, for example, pathway programming. So, helping people figure out how do I get from a point, one point in my career through a training and development program up to certification up to holistic integrated financial planning. I think there's an opportunity for, for me, a real key is on ecosystem building. So how do we connect the educators to the employers, to the professional body, to the regulators, and really support and nurture that. But, but when I think when it comes to the, um, the practitioners themselves, to the certified financial planner professionals, one of the things that we have seen over the last couple of years is an emergence on the part of our affiliates in saying they really want to connect the CFP professionals in their territories much more directly to the global community. So, you know, I mentioned before, a lot of times FPSB works through the affiliate. And so to, to a large extent, often CFP professionals in a territory might be not that familiar with FPSB because in essence, we're behind the scenes representing through the affiliate. But we're now seeing an increasing desire on the part of the affiliates to say, actually, let's bring global to our CFP professionals in a territory and let's bring our CFP professionals in a territory up to global. And so one of the things that we started last year was what we were calling our Financial Planet Live webinar series. And uh, I don't know if you remember, we, we, we did a, it was a webinar with um, a, a CFP professional from Australia, um, Adele Martin, who, who went to a fully virtual practice and had a whole system of how she used social media to engage and, and retain clients. And that was, we had over 3,000 CFP professionals from around the world participate live in that one session. So we're, we're really excited to pick that up again this year. We're going to have another uh, Financial Planet Live webinar coming out. I think it's on the 8th of September this year. And we'll be focusing on topics and themes that will have global applicability. But the goal for us is going to be to really start bringing interesting ideas, best practices, community connection to CFP professionals directly through the network um, and leveraging speakers from around the world into conferences. And even also then looking at, is there ways that we can increase the opportunity for you know expert level or advanced level continuing professional development training? Yeah. So you know with, 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 with COVID and with everybody going digital, um, it's much, much easier for us to participate in each other's conferences and to share information. Although um, I have, Jackie, shared with people how 
on the last um, conference in the UK, you and I got trapped in the digital <laughs> elevator. But yeah. um, but but once once we learn how to use the technology properly and and get from the elevator to the digital stage, um, I think we can have a very good experience. Yes. Well, we had fun along the way getting stuck in the elevator, <laughs> anyway, didn't we? <laughs> well, and, and, and my issue was, how do you get stuck in a digital elevator? But I'm like, we did, we did, and we survived. We did. That's going to be a well first, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think for our listeners, what what we'll do if it's if it's okay with you is we we'll pop pop the link to the eighth uh, of September webinar uh, along with this podcast when it's. Um, uh, and so people can find it easily uh, to click on to attend if they want to. That, that would be fantastic. And, and as I said, we'll run it live. Um, clearly, we're in many, many time zones, so it'll also be recorded as well. But, but we love the live participation because then there's an opportunity for dialogue and chat across the global CFP professional community. So yeah. I'd, I'd appreciate you sharing that link. Yes. Yeah, of course, absolutely. And so let's move on then and look at the future. What does the global profession of financial planning, what does it look like? Where where are the next steps for the FPSB and actually for, for all of us who are certified financial planners? Yeah, look, it, it's a good question and it's something that we need to be looking to. Um, the, the timing has been really interesting and good for Financial Planning Standards Board in that this year we've embarked on two major projects. Um, one was our global job analysis study, where we go out and we actually survey CFP professionals and ask them about the current actual practice of financial planning. And we do that just to make sure that our standards and our content and our exams are appropriate. But the other aspect of that that we've embarked on this year and that I'm really looking forward to the results of is we have run out a future of financial planning survey as well that's in the field right now. I think it's out in something like 12 of our jurisdictions. And part of it, part of what we're trying to do, Jackie, is get to this better understanding of where do practitioners see things heading? Where, where do they think they need to focus? Where do they think we as certifying professional bodies need to focus? And, and for us, we, what we want to do is to make sure that we are always looking forward and having a sort of a future view and future proofing the profession as we go. And, and, you know, if you remember sort of back in 2015, 2016, the, there was the rise of the machines, FinTech was coming and the world was ending. And to some extent, the world didn't end. Um, what, what happened was the hybrid model has won out. Um, but I think there's now opportunities as we look forward to say, okay, are we using the technology as smart as we can? Is, in fact, technology giving us the chance to stop doing those things that competent, ethical, and highly qualified financial planners should not be doing and really use the technology to take away the administrative, the repetitive tasks allowing the CFP professionals to really focus on the clients and giving great advice to the clients. And, and to some extent, in that process, a key issue for the future for me is how clients are changing. Yeah. So we're, we're starting to have conversations around the fact that, you know, as you know, a lot of our countries where we offer certified financial planner certification have aging populations. And so with aging populations comes lots of different issues and interesting issues and challenging issues for practitioners who suddenly are like, well, where's the intersection of healthcare and financial advice? And, and as you'll remember, um, we put out a, a guidance practice note to CFP professionals two, two three years ago now um, on you know working with vulnerable clients. We... We see this approach going forward as increasingly important. So as there are shifts um, in either in aging, as there are shifts in what consumers expect or need from financial advice, we have to make sure that we're tracking those, we're responding to those, and that we're guiding practitioners so that they can give the best advice that they can give. Uh, you know, one, one of the things for me um, that I keep reading about is 
either the back to normal or the not back to normal post COVID. And I, and I feel like I'm not sure we're ever going back to normal, whatever, whatever normal was, Jackie, I don't think we're going back yes, there. It's gone. <laughs> it's gone. And, and so with that now comes, okay, how are people living? Um, y- you know, you've got younger generations of people who are saying, you know what, I'm not going to work, you know, for 30 years, retire, be retired for 20 and die on time. Right. You have young people yeah. who are saying, I'm going to, I'm going to work here for two or three years. I'm going to take a year off and I'm going to go and see Machu Picchu. And then I'm going to come back and do something else. And in that process, the way people are living their lives, the way the world of work is changing is going to require the financial planners change how they're advising those clients. And for me, I think there's a wonderful opportunity to even yet further highlight the value proposition of financial planning, because it isn't going to be saying to this, you know, generations of people who are saying, I'm going to live and work differently that, oh, well, you've got to save and invest the same old way. I think it's going to be important to say, okay, we'll be your coach. We'll be your advisor. We're going to be with you every step of the way. And by the way, we're going to help you live the, the life you want to live because you're making smart financial decisions. So so it's going to be very interesting over the next couple of years between, you know, changing expectations in the workforce, changing expectations around how people want to live their lives, longevity and technology. So we live in interesting times. We do indeed. Uh, one of my one of my favorite analogies when people have asked me what financial planning is and what the difference is are is that I say well it, you know it's like having a car um, you know you pick your flashy car you know you don't really look what's under the bonnet um, but you need to know where you're going in it and your financial planner will sit next to you and will you know be the sat nav if you like um, in order to get you to wherever it is you want to go without the engine of, of income and investments and savings then that's the bit that drives drives the car um, but you don't often look at what it is. It's actually you're focusing on your destination. Right. And, and, and maybe even as an extension of that as well. And then this goes back to the trust that we've got to not only build in financial planning, but that we've got to earn as well. But the idea being that ultimately I'd like us to get to a point where the clients can rely on the ethical obligation, the client first obligation of their financial planner or their financial advisor. So they can say, you know what? I'm not even sure if there's wheels on the car, but my financial planner has got me tracked and we're good to go. So so look, and, and, and I, I say that flippantly in that, of course, we're still looking for a level of participation and obligation on the part of the client to be an active participant in the process. But, but I'd love us to get to a point where people are really able to come to their planner saying, Here, here's the life I want to live. Here's the goals I want to get to. And the planner is really that active support to get them there. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, the, this, the changing demographics of the populations around the world also have interesting knock-on effects for the actual financial planners, because obviously we are an aging population of certified financial planners as well. Um, and, you know, we I've got some people on my um, career pathway up to CFP, you'll be glad to know, who are millennials who have chosen to work four days a week. Mm-hmm. Um, they still want to be CFPs in the future, um, but actually that's part of their their new lifestyle and particularly because of, of COVID and everything, they want to be able to get out and socialise more um, so where do you foresee the challenges and kind of the more interesting things to happen of the development of the, the group of pool of certified financial planners in the future? Yeah, look, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. Like, I remember I was on a panel one time in Singapore, um, you know, a few years back, and somebody in the audience asked one of the other panelists a question. And they said, he, it was a CFP professional and they said, hey, what do your clients look like? And the CFP professional said, they look like me. And I actually first started laughing because I was I was like, uh, that's, uh, you know, I thought he was just being funny. But in fact, he was like, no, this is such a, a personal experience that quite often the engagements are over multiple years, maybe even multiple generations. And 
you know, by by default almost, CFP professionals end up attracting a community of clients that share their values, that share their um, experiences around money, and that really feel connected to these individual practitioners. And, and I think that's key then as we look at the future of the profession and we look at younger generations coming in. Because ultimately, I, th- I think we need to see the same thing happen um, at that level. So we need younger planners to bring younger clients to financial planning. We need women. We need people of color. We need people coming from traditionally underserved markets. And and the key part here is it's not just enough for us to bring in all of these different communities into the financial planning profession, but we also then actually have to keep them. And so, you know, for me, it's about making sure the profession is attractive. Like I've, I've talked to CFP professionals, maybe from certain ethnicities or women who say, yeah, I'll go to the conference and I'm the only one of me there. That's a problem. So, so when we look at whether it's, you know, an age group like millennials, whether it's an ethnic group, whether it's a gender group, we've got to be a profession that says, you know what? We can actually make this work for you. And if you're going to work four days a week, if you are going to have a niche that is hyper-specialized with a certain community of interest, we can make that happen. And when you come to our conferences, you come to our events, you're going to see others just like you because that's what actually is going to create that community of belonging. So, so, so you know, for me, I think we've certainly, you know, to some extent, I think maybe we'll often hear, well, millennials are comfortable with technology and those ancient creatures who are over 50 are infinitely not. And it turns out that that's not so much the case. I, I, like, I think what we've seen over the last year and a half is every client of every age, every practitioner of every age can get very comfortable with technology. Um, I think even as, you know, they're shifting ideas about work and whether it's four days a week or whether it's super flexible schedules or kind of work from anywhere, um, I think that applies across age groups. I think it acri- applies across communities of interest. For, for me, you know, what, what's interesting in this is, and, and this is just, um, it, it's a historical artifact, but at one point, uh, you know, a lot of the communities that were coming into financial planning, they would use a term like next gen or next generation financial planners. And of course, as you know, the millennials now are 40, 40 plus. Yes. And, and really the next gen that we have to focus on are the Gen Zs and the alphas. And so while I think it's really important that we, of course, attract millennials to the profession, um, certainly from Financial Planning Standards Board's point of view, from the FBSB Network's point of view, we've also now got to be looking through to what do the Gen Zs want? What do the alphas want? And quite frankly, they're often as distinct from each other as maybe millennials are from baby boomers. So, so we've got to keep looking to that future and evolving with it. And, and you know, from a certification and training point of view, is that micro-credentials? Is that um, changing up our assessment and exams? Is that creating internships, externships, mentorships? I think there's a lot of opportunities here for us to really connect to these communities to say, how do you want to learn? How do you want to work? How do you want to be part of a community of professionals? And then we become that profession. And I think that's really interesting. I'm just thinking about my 12 year old. He is, you know, not interested in reading a book, which he has to do for his uh, school holidays. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What um, what, what kind of holidays are those, Jackie? Those sound like terrible (laughs) holidays. Yes, indeed. Um, But it just, interesting to see how you know technology is you know they've grown up with it um and you know it's embedded um in everybody's lives but i think you know it comes more natural to some people than others of of all ages actually um and it's really interesting how you know there's the rise of 
you know, little videos um, and, you know, that that there will be inevitable changes to the way that other people will start to learn as time goes by, won't they? Because I think, you know, having a little, you know, our attention span, hasn't it, has shrunk from something like two minutes to like 20 seconds or something now. Um, um, no, and, and seriously, like, can, can you imagine your son being told, OK, now you're going to have a six hour exam today and that will be followed by another four hour exam tomorrow. That that may not be the most appealing thing no. he'll he'll hear. So. So, yeah. So we, we've got to look. And again, it's not about lowering the standard and it's not yeah. about sort of taking away critically important steps. But there's certainly an opportunity to rethink the way we do things. And to present it in a way where the learning, the training, the assessment is there, the assurance to the public of the competency is there, but that it doesn't necessarily have to be the way it's always been. And so that's that's a key part of the conversation our professional standards committee globally and our network is having this year as we're going through the results of our job analysis and our future financial planning research. Yeah. I mean, what do they say? If you're if you're not moving forward, if you're not changing, then you're you're dying essentially. So we've got to be flexible as a network, haven't we, of, of CFP professionals to accommodate those changes? Yeah, and and look to to me also, even being open to the fact that there may not be one path, um, and and I think that's the key part as well. I think sometimes you know it's easy as a professional community or as a professional body to say, okay, I've worked this thing out and this will be the way it shall be done. Yeah. And I and I think being flexible and open to, well, these people want to learn this way. This group are interested in this approach to assessment. This this community needs this level of engagement. And the and and I think that is something we're definitely seeing emerge is this idea of more hyper customization just in time that it's really this sort of one-on-one -on -one immediacy of the connection of the profession to the participant and now look that that takes effort that takes um understanding what what the communities are and what their needs are but i think it's a, it's a great opportunity for us and especially leveraging technology in creating that sense of this is my profession and it, it's meeting me where I need to be met. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And encourage in that encourages the longevity of people coming into the profession. If they feel that they belong, if they feel that they have a voice, if they feel that they can help improve and change things, then, then that will lead them to hopefully stay. Well, uh, uh, totally. And, and Jackie, to me, what's kind of fascinating is every now and again, people will be like, Look at all these older planners. We need some young ones. And I say, hold on, hold on. Yes. But also, isn't it absolutely amazing that there are people who started in the profession of financial planning? There are people who got their certified financial planner certification 30 plus, 40 plus years ago, and they're still loving the profession they're in. Yeah. They are thriving with their clients. And that's the part for me that I think is amazing is that I personally know lots and lots of CFP professionals who are well past retirement age and, and their comment is, why would I retire? I'm doing what I love. And, and so for me, again, it's, it's sure, let's, let's build the pipeline, let's bring in fresh energy, new blood, but also the fact is there's a ton of wisdom, there's a ton of experience and, and and I will say there's there's individuals in the UK that I see quite active on social media. And I've honestly known them for 30 years. And it's amazing to see that passion and energy still coming out for financial planning and CFP certification. So yeah. I'm I'm excited to see us leverage that further uh, for for the benefit of promoting financial planning, promoting CFP certification in the UK. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Look forward to all of that. And so Talking about the CFPs in the UK, um, obviously we, we still don't have as many, we've talked about this many times in the past, haven't we? Um, why has the UK got so few CFP professionals compared to um, other comparable territories around the world? Um, and But I think the numbers are 
hopefully this year going to rise a little um, and there certainly is a lot more talk a lot more chatter about the new CFP pathway that CISI launched a couple of years ago now um, and you, where, what would you say to people don't say find a friend which we've had this conversation before but um what would you say to people who are kind of on the fence you know I'm, I'm kind of quite interested maybe the cfp um but but you know i, I you know i think it's going to be a lot of work is it going to be really something for me can it really help my business as much as people seem to say it does Sure. Yeah. Look, and and you and I have had conversations. I wonder if that find a friend one was a personal one. We'll come back to that. Um, I hope I found one. Um, so absolutely. It, yeah. In the UK, the the number of CFP professions has been um, smaller than than we'd like it to be for some time, and I think it's been a point of interest. You know, internationally, sometimes when we share the data and we say. You know, here's 90,000 CFP professionals in the U.S., here's 5,000 in Australia, and then there's 1,000 or 900 in, in the U.K. There's, there's been global interest in what's, what's that about? And, and look, there's, a, there's any number of reasons, and I think we could talk an entire other podcast on mm-hmm. sort of historically how the system in the U.K. has worked and how it's been set up. But, but where I stand right now is we've been... Uh, in close conversation with uh, CISI really around this issue of growing the number of CFP professionals in the UK. And I think CISI is putting a lot of the things in place that's needed. So as you talked about, getting this pathway to take people from the level four up to the level six to certify financial planner uh, certification, that's really key. Another thing that we heard over some time, and and we did some research with the CFP professionals earlier in the year, was just this connecting the education and training to the assessment and making the assessment more coherent and approachable and accessible to individuals who are going through it. And so I know we've done a lot of work there as well. You know, I would say sometimes one of the best ways to grow is to put a focus on growth. And so that is the conversation we've been having with CISI to say, let's actually turn this these numbers um, around and let's start to, to grow the CFP professional population in the UK. And that means more outreach to firms, to employers, to actually onboard CFP professionals to commit to training younger people or people who are looking to career change into CFP certification. And it also means let's start to more actively promote financial planning and certified financial planner certification. The, the other thing that I think will go a long way towards it, and, and I know you talked about a friend, so I won't over-focus on it, but the community aspect is huge. Yeah. Uh, it, it has always been... Um, such a strong part of the UK program. And I think this is something, there's an opportunity here for CISI in the UK and leveraging FBSB globally to really reconnect back to those local chapters, to bring back in the brand ambassadors, to post-COVID, of course, connect back into those in-person conferences that were just such a, an attractor to people in the profession are looking to come into the profession as well. So, yeah. so we, we've got a lot of plans in place, the focus really around helping the pipeline move through, engaging more actively with next generation groups in the UK, with employers in the UK, looking at connecting more substantially to the CFP professional community at both the UK and global levels. And then ultimately for us, keep it, keeping a focus on growth and really looking and making sure that we are growing the number of CFP professionals in the UK. Yeah. And I think what's been lovely is that we've got um, about half a dozen people so far who have already lined up to talk in future podcasts, uh, all certified financial planner professionals, and um, uh, we haven't been turned down yet. So everybody is um, who we are approaching to, to talk about their story, why they became a CFP. Um, everybody is very willing, I think, just as perhaps they many always have, have been, 
Um, they're very willing to share those stories. Um, so to help encourage, um, you know, the next generation of certified financial planners and, and many more future ones. Yeah, and, and that's what I was talking about earlier. I mean, that level of, it's not just there's a community, it's an engaged community, it's an open community, it's a sharing community, and that's what will attract others in, and that's what will make them want to stay as well. And I think it's been a very special part of the UK program and certainly the global CFP professional community as yeah. well. It's nothing to do with me twisting everybody's arm either. <laughs> well, you know, if, you, if you've got a good arm twisting technique, <laughs> go with it <laughs> right well we've come to the end of our session today i'd just like to thank noel once again you've been absolutely brilliant thank you for launching our podcast talking about everything certified financial planner related it's been an absolute pleasure well my pleasure too jackie good luck with the podcast and i'd love to come back in six months time and we'll check in and see how everything's going with your podcast and with our Excellent. cfp certification in the uk thanks a million fantastic thank you very much take care bye now bye. i hope you enjoyed that conversation with noel He's quite an inspirational character and has great insight into the global financial planning community. Join me next time when we'll be covering other things relating to becoming a certified financial planner. And also we'll be taking time out from that to interview some new people who are just entering the profession, who have just entered the profession this year. And uh, we will be following their progress on a regular basis as well. So join me next time for more special guests.